Hello and welcome to the Sky Dog Podcast, Horse Love, where I'm going to be talking with a whole variety of people about their love of horses. Come join us. Take me where your river flows. I want to drive on your open road like the wilderness where we are born singing woe. Above the books over there. It's Buddy. Is it, it's no, it's actually Elvis on his horse Rising Sun, which you gave me so many Christmases ago. Oh. And I had it up in our tax shed at Sunset Ranch. And it then has moved with me from ranch to ranch. It was in Calabasas and now it's here. And I even named a horse. I name a lot of horses after Elvis. Obviously, you know my Elvis obsession, but we have a Palomino called Rising Sun that we rescued from a kill pen. We Aww. have, yeah, we have a Presley, we have a Tupelo, we have a Memphis about to come next week. It's very sad. My poor followers. Uh, have do you be- have a Presley and an Aaron? I have a Presley, but not an Aaron. I have an Elvis who you know well. Right. Oh, well. <laughs> How is Elvis? He's good. He thinks he's a Mustang. It's so adorable. He, you know, Elvis was always injuring himself and running up massive vet bills. And after I'd been like two or three years into Skydog, I kind of was like, I can't keep doing this, Elvis. And the vet said, take him by the ears and say, look, Elvis, you know, I can't do it again. Next time it's going to be, he has not injured himself or been sick since. He's no. like, that's fine. I'll go off and be a Mustang. And he oh. loves it out there. He has two best friends called Otis and Dollar. So, yes, I'm very excited to get into and welcome Matthew Reese. Thank you very much. And Mustang oh. advocate, I would say, yeah. because yeah. there is a line and, and, and people are right now in the midst of getting the first, we've shipped out about 1500 copies of the coffee table book and we have 5,000, but we're going to sell out and have to order more. Oh, it's, been, it's been so well received and people are loving oh. it. And Matthew Weiss writes the introduction to the coffee table book. And there was no one else that I could ask to do it because when I think about, and there is a line, I'm just going to read this. This is Matthew wrote this. Early conversations of Sky Dog Ranch and Sanctuary were born atop these Mustangs as we roamed the hills around the iconic Hollywood sign and Claire wrestled with how best to help the horse's plight. And that is, that is going all the way back to the beginning. And I, yes. I would love to ask you, first of all, even before Mustangs, yeah. where did your love of horses begin? My love of horses began with my uncles and their farms in mid Wales. Um, and Wales, much like very much, or, you know, Ireland and Scotland, well, and England, I was going to say the Celtic countries, but the whole of UK, I think, has a very healthy interest in the, in the equine world. Uh, and Wales especially. And, and my, my grandmother grew up on a farm that then became like a pony tracking farm. My uncles had horses and we were just it was in that wild way. You would throw, no one taught us how to post or put our heels down or anything like that. We jumped on these poor things and held on for dear life and didn't die. Neither did, nor us, nor the horses, I, I hasten to add. Um, and it sort of started there, summer holidays on the farms, really, just kind of, you know, doing all the wrong things, like giving them sugar lumps, because you've read about it in a book. Um, uh, so, so I stopped that. Um, and yeah, t- teaching ourselves how to ride so so like pilots in a way and it's really funny because i remember the very first time we met in la my grandmother and grandpa my on my mother's side were welsh yes and i remember telling you that and um the next day you you dropped off a welsh flag folded up for me which we then later used when all our family came around but i would remember living in england every time we went up to see granny and granddad as we crossed over the border into Wales, we would sing, there'll be a welcome in the hillside, there'll be a welcome in Wales. And I then spent the next kind of two hours from the border to Glyneath, scouring the hills for Welsh ponies, you know, and yeah. that's all I wanted to do when my mom asked what, what I wanted to do. I wanted to go for a picnic in the Bracken Beacons because I was going to see 
wild horses. And I would climb these freaking hills. I was probably seven or eight trying to get close to them. And I would sit in the grass just staring at them. And I think yeah. how extraordinary that even back then, I don't know where that came from. And I very, very similarly to you, used to go through the woods in Cobham, Surrey. There was a neighbor, I guess, who had horses and I would try and get them to the to the fence with an apple or something and then just yeah. jump on and hold on for dear life. As they yeah. took off and even falling off when you're little, it's like part of the fun. You kind yes. of... And, and but also but Wales, you know, on a far far smaller scale Wales, Wales has a very small kind of wild horse community dotted around the entire you know because it's a very small country but all over the country there are these pockets of wild horses I remember going to a, a friend of mine in Swansea where the, the wild horses are on the common it was it, the kids would ride these horses because they were cheaper than BMXs or bikes yeah so they there is this, there is, and also, yes, the same, the, the, the Welsh mountain pony, which is partly why I, I think I have this love for Mustangs. Partly that, but there's this, there is this wild horse community or these wild horse communities in Wales and the type of horse, which is this tough as nails, usually, you know, Welsh mountain, you know, well, you know, those ponies or the, or the cobs that are just hardy, sure footed tough as old leather great horses which is which is why i you know i think i naturally have this love and affinity for mustangs yeah i i agree i never really traced it back to that but same you know it, it's i don't know why i was so fascinated by them but but also kind of was so Ex like I didn't know horses just ran wild. I thought they were in a stable and you ride them, but it yeah. definitely gave me an understanding of, oh no, they, this is their homeland. This is where they were born. And this is where really survival of the fittest in terms of those herds over centuries have honed a horse, you know, very similar to the Mustang that is just incredible you know can survive on nothing and uh, yeah. a sort of tumbleweed and and their feet like dinner plates and I, I it's funny I never even thought really to think about all of that but we have that in common which is crazy yeah, yeah. and then I want to skip forward to wow. when I met you I remember I talked about the fact that did I have Buddy at the time maybe just Buddy at the beginning Yes. Maybe, yeah. Maybe or during the time that we knew each other, I got Buddy. You got Buddy. You got Buddy. Because remember the first time we went to the ranch, you didn't have a horse. I remember that. That's Actually, right. You got Buddy. It's coming back now. You got Buddy. Yeah. And 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 there was this moment. Sorry to interrupt. There was this moment where I was like, you know, the the freeze tag and everything. It, Buddy was, suddenly was this incredibly exotic creature because I'd never never come across. A Mustang. So the, all all of a sudden there were all these all these questions about why, why does he have this marking? Where does he come from? Why why does he look like that? Why is he not? Doesn't he like treats or carrots? You know. But yeah, you, and oh, buddy was an incredible, incredible. He was incredible. And you and I used to go riding, and you would usually um, ride Buddy, and I had my horse Elvis. So Elvis was yeah. called the horse, and then I got Buddy, and and same just. We'd be out riding and someone would ask about the brand. Some people yeah. understood that that was a BLM brand and asked what herd he was from. All things I had no answers to because I yeah. didn't know about the issue. So Buddy was like, I guess my gateway horse. He he started oh. all of this. And I remember I, I would ride Elvis, you would ride Buddy. And, and then we started the crazy conversation about the possibility of going to get one more Mustang for you. Yeah. And we yeah. found out that there was a couple actually at the ranch who had gone to the Carson City prison auction and come back with two. So that yeah. kind of like, oh, you know, you can actually go there and get them and they're trained. And so it led to the craziest adventure, which I would yeah. love to hear you talk about where you and I, and a journalist actually, a wonderful uh, girl that you knew wanted to do a story yeah. about it. Yeah, We yeah. flew up to Reno Got yeah. up early in the morning and went to Carson City Prison to the auction. Yeah. Can you tell I us mean, about that process? Yes. Well, well, I mean, that was it. Was it was all kind of it was all kind of happening around time. I just want to say quickly about riding Buddy. 
because that was my first time riding a horse that had, he was like, he was part horse, part mythical creature to me because he still had this incredibly wild instinct to him. So you were very aware immediately when you got him, it, you weren't riding this kind of bomb proof, bred in a bar, born and raised in a barn, horse, yeah. animal, thing, creature. You were riding something that in the true sense, you know, when some people, when they train horses that say you ask the horse, that was my first real introduction when I was like, oh, you must really ask this horse. Because the second you tried to muscle him, he was like, no, 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 no. You had, he had such a strong line of wild in him with this enormous kind of gracious way of going, I will do this for you, but I'm just going to let you know my yeah. origins, my origins are wild. Yes. Anyway, I digress. So, so yes. Yeah, so my friend Anne called me up. She was like, listen, horse and hound. <laughs> and I remember this. This always made me laugh because of the film, because, um, uh, it's Notting Hill, right? when, when Hugh Grant goes, hello, I'm, I'm with uh, Horse and Hound. But it actually, won the, it is the oldest equine um, uh, publication in the, in the United Kingdom. Horse and Hound have found out about the Mustangs. Can you do a story about them? And I was like, found out what? About what? What they found out? And then she explained to me then about the prison system, you know, how they buy them. And then she said, can you, can, would you be interested in going along as part of that story? I was like, well, yes, funny you should say that, because my friend Claire's bought a Mustang, and this is all, this is all, and friends of ours got Mustangs at the barn, and this is all come together. So we, so I remember going, well, no, first of all, I had to call, because we were entering, the, we were going into the prison, I had to call forward to, to get our security clearances. So I had to give you all name and details, I give my name and details, and then we said, and then the, the guy was like, you're, you're here with a, you're going to be doing a, an article for a, a magazine. I said, yes, we are. And he, and he goes, What's the name of the magazine? I went, uh, Horse and Hound. And he was like, like the movie? And I was like, I was like, well, well, he references it, but it's not like the movie. It is a real magazine. I just thought it was filled with suspicion. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so then we, we got up there. And, and I just remember going, so I did the research into what this, what it was that the prisoners were doing by, you know, taking on these wild mustangs and partnering them with, with, incarcerated um, men uh, and the, the kind of, the well, I was gonna say, this wasn't really, it's not really training. I, when I think about what, what they both, what man and horse go through, it's a kind of, oh, it's, me, it's many fold. It's, it's, you know, I remember one guy saying it's an awakening for horse and man. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a friendship in fundamental terms. It's, it's, it's the greatest kind of learning curve that so many of them said they've, they've been on. Anyway, yeah. keep me on track, Sibbles, right? So I, so we go, so we go, uh, yeah, so we go to cars and we go into the facility <clears throat> and we, we had, did the interview with Thomas Smittles when he was discussing, you know, how long he'd been working. And I, you know, I was staggered immediately to say, well, they give you 90 days. And I was like, what do you mean they give you 90 days? Surely it just takes as long as it takes. And they're like, no, you're given 90 days and that's it. You have to kind of bond gentle, you know, they, no, no one ever said break the horse, right? Well, with it, you have to do whatever, you know, you have to, they call them gently, you know, you have to gently in 90 days. It's like, well, what, what if you don't in 90 days? He goes, well, no one's ever not. Because also what they have, unfortunately, is time. So the, the amount of intensive time they can have together it, over, nine, over three months is enormous compared to people who, you know, who, who can't have that time. Um, oh, and just a side note, I remember the guy, the guy, um, Bob, I can't remember his last name, who ran the program, mm. says, to me, the greatest moment you have is when we take someone, we take a horse, and we just put them in a round pen, and we leave them, and that's it. And you have two creatures who have very similar past experiences, who have the same fears, the same stress, will go through the same emotions while they circle each other for what can be one to two hours. Yeah. And he goes, and that is the, the, the most important moment of the, the entire experience for horse, horse and man. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, they, they take these horses who've had enormous trauma, these men who've had enormous trauma, who have enormous trust issues. And, and over, over this time period, 
they let them come to each other. So it's the, almost the greatest exercise in trust you'll ever witness. And then, so, I, I, well, I don't have to tell you what, what hap one that ha happens after a bunch of interviews, and we've been watching them, you know, in the pens. You go to the auction. And I just remember being open-mouthed, slack-jawed. When the first horse came out, and they go, and bearing in mind they had 90, 90 days, so I'm like, this horse is just going to run around the arena. You know, it's going to go, you know, they'd be lucky if they got a rope on it. And they walk these horses out <clears throat> as if they've been at dressage school for years. Like, they're pitch perfect. So I'm, I'm already going, what? How? It can't be 90. There's no way it's 90 days. They're doing side passes. They're doing running for the drills. And I remember then Thomas Mills comes out and he has two horses. And we were like, oh. And they were clearly brothers. And we're like, oh no, he has brothers. Because I was already going, I, I, no, I, you sure remember. I was like, oh, well, we need to buy one of his horses. Because, uh, you know, <clears throat> Thomas is also a, a Native American who'd already trained horses and, and had an enormous amount of respect and reverence. Uh, at Carson for his skills. So he brings these two horses out, as I know you remember, and starts putting them through their paces using hand signals. And it was at that time I was like, oh, good grief, this is, they, well, well one, of them, one of them has to come home. And then it was at that time you lent across and you went, you can't split them up. Well, and I was on very, very strict instructions not to come home with a horse. But then I, when we were sitting there watching them, I remember, you know, and you were like, you, I think you picked Jimmy first. Yes, and, and then they were sort of calling to each other. And I remember the bidding had started on Bono and you suddenly turned to me and said, do you want to go half steak, blah, half <laughs> and everything, halves on the horse and half the... And I was like, well, that's not coming home with a whole horse. It's coming home with a half a horse. I so you you had a, you did you would have a, a great argument of saying I didn't come back with a horse or yeah. a whole a whole horse just and I just remember it happened so quickly yeah. and but hand was shooting up in the air and you were like do it do it and all of a sudden and and I just remember the next thing the gavel being hit and you were like sold and I was like oh who bought them and you were like you did we you did we did we we you did and I'm just going oh, how do we get them back to California. And so began the great and journey. So began. And what it led to, and there's a picture in the book of you with Jimmy and Bono. And 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 I do remember how laughable it was because when we got them back, they had sort of said, you know, they're green broke and you really need to ride them every day. You know, don't let them sit. So yeah. that, that was really, you know, and you were in the middle of filming Brothers and Sisters and you would do a, a whole day's work or sometimes come ride them at six in the morning. I'd get up and, you know, get up there with you. Yeah. and. And I couldn't understand why my, um, if I, whichever one was I was writing, they, they didn't seem to do the things that Thomas Smithall could do. I would, I would wave yeah. my hand thinking yeah, no. oh, he's going to side no. pass now or put my foot on this. Yeah. Uh, they were like, oh, no, we're not doing that for you. But, so, uh, yeah, but you had better luck. Well, yes, but there was one, uh, there was one thing I did, <clears throat> which I, and I don't know if it was wise or not. But I dressed as Thomas dressed. So I always wore, at the beginning, I always wore a denim shirt and the, and the blue jeans because I just thought it was. But if you remember, they were strange around women at first because they, they'd never met any women. So they kind of would, I mean, the whole ranch experience for them, where they were just like, what is going on? Because they literally, they'd come off the mountains straight to the pens and straight to, you know, to Carson. Um, so there was this, in and then we brought them to Los Angeles. So there was this incredible amount of stimulus. I remember things like, you know, out on trail, like umbrellas and, and push chair, you know, strollers were just like, they were like, what are these things? Yeah. Uh, and God bless them. You know, they took a lot of stuff in their stride, but like there was a lot, of, we threw a lot of stimulus at them. I mean, if you remember, you know, all those rides, especially night. Like, you look out over the, the cityscape of Los Angeles. And if you, <clears throat> if, I don't know if you know this, from the, from the film uh, Close Encounters of uh, Third Kind, Steven Spielberg took a plate shot of that view from Mulholland and then flipped it. And that's the spaceship, right, in Close Encounters. And I remember thinking, these poor horses looking out, just going, what is going on? It's like we were in the wild, then we went to this other place, now, we're in, we're in, we're in, um, 
the center of showbiz. I know, and and it was the center of showbiz because you and I inadvertently somehow sort of started a riding club of British actors who would <laughs> come riding with us on these half wild American yeah. things, galloping around the hills. I remember yeah. Gerard Butler came and yeah. you brought um, Tim Roth up. He used to come yeah. a lot. And, yeah. and yeah. there was Bailey Chase who was in Longmire playing Dave, the cowboy. Dave, Dave Annabelle came. Dave was... Annabelle, yes. So yeah. many different people came up and just wanted the, I remember Jennifer Lawrence came up with Nicholas Holt and she was like, all I've ever wanted. She'd grown up in Kentucky around horses. And she was like, yeah. I've always had a dream to ride an American Mustang, you know? And it was an incredible way of sort of spreading awareness. I started taking pictures of different people with the horses yeah. and I had no idea what for, but of course now, you know, those pictures oh. were on our website, you know, if people stand yeah. with a Mustang and it, it's kind of crazy that it all began but, from that. But I, th I think the, the one of the big draws is when you kind of said, when someone found out you had a horse, they go, all right. And then you told the story. He goes, well, they're like, well, what is it? Or what type of horse do you have? And, you're like, and you say, well, it's actually an American, it's a Mustang. And you go, and they go, what, like the wild horses? Yes. And then you'd go into the story. Yeah. And then immediately everyone go, well, can I come and ride it? Because I, 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 I think that's, that's part of this whole romantic notion of the, of the Mustang, that everyone, the law that, you know, L-O-R-E, that, that follows them, that, that, that garners this kind of, this admiration, this excitement, right? It's not, you know, it, it, it's now become something far, far, far greater than the, the actual, the, the truth of, of a horse that's come off a mountain. You know what I mean? It's, it's what they represent that people get quite intoxicated by and go, can I please come and ride? Because they it would blow their minds that they were riding a horse that ran wild on, on the plains. It was, it, it still blows my mind. I still now look back and I go, God, I can't believe, I, you know, we did that and we I ride them around. We did that. It, and I know. It, there's an amazing book that at some point it would be great for you to read it. It's by Dave Phillips, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And he wrote a book called Wild Horse Country. And, the thing I love about that book, that was like from the first opening, he goes to a roundup and the way that he describes the roundup and the Mustang and having never had any experience about horses, he just kind of sort of took a deep dive into this issue and went and interviewed a lot of different uh, the stakeholders. But the he talks a lot about the American Mustang and how it was written about, especially during a period of time with these incredible novels and books about the, the the sort of the phantom mustang and and all these things and when i when i was growing up i grew up in england and i was still watching little house on the prairie bonanza the virginian and yeah. through that i was like i love horses you know because you could watch yeah. the cowboy and indian films or anything and i would cry if an if a, an indian or a horse died i would cry if a cowboy got you know 18 arrows in him i would somehow feel a great sense of you know writing the wrong that was being done yeah. and you know so i think so many people's love of horses grew out of that and and they were written about in such and he describes it these different authors that wrote about mustangs back in that era you know of when the then yeah. the the Wild Horse and Borough Act came in in 1971 and it changed things. But, you know, up until then, they had really, you know, if you look at a film like that James Dean film, The Misfits, with right, Marilyn right. Monroe, you know, he, he's a yeah. Mustanger. And, yeah. and that's what people did. They went out there and, and wrote these horses and threw a tire off to slow them down and, you know, took them to the to the slaughterhouse. And, and it, it that was a powerful movie when I was growing up. And you know, and I think that's a lot of why I do a lot of the social media, because I kind of feel like that's the way to kind of maybe get a new generation, you know, involved in this issue. And and hopefully they are the change, you know, they will bring the change for the wild horses that they need. But yeah, yeah. It, is, it is all of that mythology and law, as you say, and just kind of these legends that follow these wild horses that creates a magical mystery about them that is so otherworldly. And, and I always felt like that about Buddy. And in fact, my husband, Chris, always goes, Buddy speaks to you, you know, like Buddy, Buddy can talk. And I was like, 
my whole story of Buddy when I was riding him and he was like, help my family, find my family. And I was like, I don't know why I just heard that or felt that, but that in a way is what started this whole journey. And when I met Laura Lee, a wild horse advocate, she she was like, well, where are his family? Let's try and find yeah. some, you know? And now we have his sister who was rounded up on the same day as him, 17 no. years later. Yeah, her name, and listen to this, Matthew, this is the craziest thing. It was on a Giving Tuesday, and we basically sort of do a thing, like every $10,000 we raise, we'll save another horse. And I remember it got to about eight or nine in the evening, everything had died down. And someone sent me a message going, you have to save another horse. You just hit the target. And I'm like, I don't have another horse because it was a target I'd set, you know, way beyond what I thought we would raise. And I knew I had a picture of this Palomino horse in Texas who was with a trader. And he had actually said to the woman, well, either you take it or I'm going to cut cut its head off because I don't have its paperwork. And I don't know whether he meant metaphorically or literally, but I thought of that horse. And when the quarantine woman sent me a video, there was something about the way she moved and walked. And I named her Birdie. And I had completely forgotten that that was Buddy's name when I got him, called her Bird. Of course. Of course. So when I got her brand red, sent it to the BLM, they came back. It was, and Buddy is from a tiny herd. It was Buddy's herd. They were rounded up on the same day and like two numbers apart. And I was just like, it's his sister. And we reunited them. And now she's always with Buddy. And it's the most. When did you reunite them? Two years ago. And so she's out with Buddy's herd. And she was just this shy little Palomino horse. And now she's kind of quite a boss mare out there. And and it's just extraordinary from all those years ago when you and I were riding around the hills, oh all these God. strange kind of God shots happened, you know, and they were kind of my way of feeling like, yeah, this is my passion and my purpose. And yeah. this is what I was supposed to do with the rest of my life, you know? Yeah. Was, you know, you knew me in my old life, you know, and, and it's funny because I was talking to Rachel Hunter on the podcast recently. She's on the board of directors now. And we knew each other really well back then. She would come riding a lot in the same. Yeah, and and it's it's just so weird that all signs just pointed to this. And it was like a kind of hand in the small of my back, just pushing me forward. Yeah. Like, you are the what you have to do this, you know? And do you, um, do you remember, do you remember the moment where you went, I'm gonna do it? Do you know what I mean? I'm gonna dedicate, dedicate myself properly. I'm gonna start Skyboat. Do you know what I mean? I remember I remember you, I remember you uh trying out the names but, yeah but remember the moment where you're like I'm gonna do it this is what I'm gonna do yeah and I guess it was buying the ranch in Oregon you know because we had saved a few more when I met my husband you know I'd gotten more involved in the Mustangs and we had saved we'd gone back to Carson City and got cash and uh Jagger yeah because I thought you know Romeo had passed away, um, Camilla's horse, who she had left with me. She went back to Sweden and asked me to take him. So we were like, well, we need a a riding horse. And back then I didn't know I wasn't going to be riding anymore, you know, but it took me yet further down this road of the Mustangs and getting to understand more about them. And I guess I'd met Chris and I feel like there was a very much a turning point of like, well, I could become, you know, some sort of lady who lunches and uh, spend my life doing, I don't know, shopping, reenacting the scene on Pretty Woman, or I could really do something meaningful with purpose for the rest of my life that would make me feel a lot happier, you know, and I was sober by then. And so it just, I think when I bought that ranch and we'd started off looking in Southern California, went to Central California, went to Northern California. And then I was like, oh, if you just cross the border, it's even cheaper land. I remember finding this, if I'd have understood what 9,000 acres looked like, I wouldn't have done it because I had no concept like 9,000 acres. I don't know. That sounds like a number, but we would go out walking fence lines, you know, and I would go, this is still our ranch. This is still our ranch. This is, you know, like how, how far does this go? But of course now it's the 
best thing we ever could have done. And, and we bought a ranch that had such amazing infrastructure without knowing it. With it, They used to breed um, elk there. So the fencing is massively high and there's all these 40 acre pens where we start the wild horses off in. And uh, yeah, so I guess there was a moment, but it, I, in my mind, I went, I'm going to save maybe 75 horses and call it good and just let them live on the land. And now we're at 300, 300, 300. <laughs> equine oh, well so we have about 250 mustangs and then the rest are donkeys or mules zebras right. donkeys and a zorse that's all so um yeah i mean it, it it really is amazing because i get to go out with the wild herds and still see buddy and jimmy who are now running wild like jimmy got some um he got ring bones, so he couldn't really be ridden anymore. And Buddy went lame for a while. So when we very first started, Buddy and Jimmy were the most incredible resource for us because we saved a few wild mares as well. And we didn't have a shoot yet to handle them in like they have at the BLM. So right. we needed to get them in. We just put a halter on Buddy and Jimmy and let and all the mares followed and we would go no. to the barn. So Buddy helped me build it. And then as we got the shoot and we got more ambitious and got more wild horses and Buddy's out with a huge herd, but he still has his little gang. He has his mares. Jimmy has two mares called Lee and Denver that are always with him. And the, all those mares have stayed so loyal to them. And they're just you know, sometimes they'll be out with the big herd and I'll come along and I'm like, buddy, you know, always when I get back, I go out to see him. And he's like, uh, mom, I'm like a wild horse. No, I'm, so, but he'll come over and like say hello. And then he's going, I have to go now. And I'm like, okay. Uh, but, you know, it just, it means so much to me that you did this because I know that our followers are just enjoying so much hearing about the beginning of Skydog and and the book was very much for that. You know, it was literally eight years and people going, you should write a book. Yeah. And this is kind of the first of a series and this is um, fam families of Skydog. We've saved 21 families and reunited families or their families that have, you know, we've taken pregnant mares who have had babies at Skydog and that's become what we're the most known for. But Without Buddy and Jimmy and Bono and those days yeah. back then, yeah. riding yeah. around Hollywood Hills. And I know that you and I used to go to rodeos together because we both had watched crazy documentaries about bull riding. And we got to know Luke Branquino and Thomas Smittle, the, the man that taught, that trained Jimmy and Bono, he is still involved with Mustangs and actually See? came to the Oregon Ranch. And there was the most incredible moment where he just stood with Jimmy and it was incredibly emotional for me, for him to have come so far, for Thomas to have come so far and still yeah. be, he helped us run the very first lot of horses through our chute to worm them and give them a shot. Oh. He taught us how to use the chute. It was extraordinary. So oh, wow. all of that came out, you know, yeah. that was when we were terrified. We're like, oh my gosh, these horses, you know, they're 25 year old band stallions that were the size of bulls, you know, and yeah. he helped us. And he, I remember we were all standing there and he pushed the first horse in and he was like, okay, everybody needs to breathe. It's like all of you are holding your breath. And I, I you know, now it's such a matter of course that we do that. And, but yeah. it's, it's so good to go down memory lane with you. And I'm, I'm so grateful. I know you're filming in Prague, I think. And yeah. the, the time to do this again at the end oh, of the always I mean there was work no and I'm, I'm I, as as anyone who is thinking of buying a horse just on a practical level I just remember how like we used to ride them up almost sheer vertical walls they were this they were the hardiest sh most sure-footed never got sick would do anything for you and go all day and they were they were and are the most the most incredible horses. And 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 in case people are wondering why they call Jimmy and Bono, I remember Thomas Mittles had mm. named them War Bonnet and Sunny Jim because War Bonnet because he was a uh, Native American himself, uh, and then Sunny Jim was the first Native American rodeo star, which is why they became Bono and Jimmy. I'm glad Jimmy's doing okay. He's doing really well as his buddy, and uh, I will give him 
your love and a kiss on the nose yeah. and a good yeah. pat for you. And Me I'm too. just so grateful. Thank you for doing the introduction to the book. I think it really brings the book together so well. And it just it just gives a sort of personal touch to it that no one else could have. So I'm really grateful. And thank you for everything you've done. You know, you, you did articles for different magazines about the Mustangs when we got them. So you have certainly done your part in raising awareness for wild horses in America. And whatever it whatever it takes, Stapler, let me know. What? Whatever it takes, Stapler, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And good luck with the rest of your filming. Hopefully I'll see you on the West Coast at some point. I'll hold you to it. Me too. Thank you, lovely. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.